Honde onde batsan. Ala sadangi akan. Koi ma aida. Nata koi gu. Nata dona atom da. De onde da. My name is Alice Sadangi, and I'm a Native American belonging to the Kiowa and Tohono O'odham tribes. The language I greeted you in is the Kiowa language. The Kiowa tribe is uh, from southwestern Oklahoma, and the uh, Tohono O'odham people are from southern Arizona. The word uh, Tohono means desert, and the word O'odham means people, desert people. My tribal heritage encompasses two unique tribes, differing linguistically, socially, and culturally. I point this out since there are still many non-tribal or non-native people who are unaware that tribal nations in the United States are not monolithic, but rather we are varied and distinct in cultural belief and practice. I would like to further welcome you to this area the traditional lands of the Akima Autumn people, the Pipash people. And the Akima Autumn people also are not only here, but there's a community down the road in Akchin and the community down the road, Gila River. They are also uh, Autumn people. The Akima Autumn uh, and Tohono Autumn are related. So we're like cousins up here. And we share also a common ancestor, the Hulgum. The Hugum were the ones who came before. That is what they're called. And they're the ones who lived in this valley, in this area. I came to this hotel and I see signs for the canal, the canal bar, the canal restaurant, the canal that you see down there. That was made by the Hugum people. They laid the foundation for the canal systems around this valley for them to cultivate food to live so that you all can visit and live here as well. So I want to honor those ancestors that were here. I want to talk a little bit more about the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community, which is the English words for what I just said, the Akima'otam and the Pipash. Their reservation is just east here. I don't know if you have come in off the freeway, but there's all these buildings on this side and on this side, there's like farmland and, and it's green and there's no buildings. That's the reservation line right there. And they have, uh, they're two unique tribes, the Akima, Autumn, and Pipash. Um, the Pipash people originally lived along the Colorado River, and they left their area, migrated up to escape warfare. They have always had an alliance with the Akima, Autumn, and they continue to live together on the reservation to the east of us um, as allies and as having this relationship. And that is the reservation there to the east. To the north, you have the Fort McDowell Yavapai Nation. And that is, uh, they are most commonly known here in the state of Arizona for paving the way for tribal gaming that happened uh, a while back. They were the first known, uh, they were the first tribe to, to sign a compact um, to allow that. They also are known among the other tribes in the area for taking a stand against a dam that was proposed, the Orm Dam, that would have flooded their traditional homelands. And so that Orm Dam that did not happen, and we thank the uh, Fort McDowell Yavapai tribe for that. They also have some famous people in their, in their lineage, in their community. Uh, Dr. Carlos Montezuma, his Indian name was Wasaja was the first uh, medical doctor that they had. He was an early intellectual in the 19th and, uh, late 19th and early 20th century. And he also was from up here, up the road, Yavapai. So all these tribes, um, they are related in that we share this landscape. And the Red Mountain, you might see also uh, to the east, that's an important site for the folks out here at the, the Akima Autumn and the Pipash, they both consider that a significant landmark. And I wanted to share this information about where you are in the geographical context, because that is so important for Native people. It's very important to know where you stand in relation to the natural world around you. It's important because the landscape uh, is, is the carrier, is the holder of uh, traditional memory, cultural memory, 
memories of when the rivers ran, and all of that serves to inspire us and strengthen us and gives us our identity of who we are as uh, Native people. So I welcome you to this place. I would like to express my thanks to the organizing committee for inviting me to speak at this conference. And when I was first contacted um, about this, I think I said, well, I'm not a tribal librarian. Um, and I know there are tribal librarians out there who could definitely share with you the issues and celebrations that they encounter on a daily basis. And if there are any in the room, make yourselves known. Any tribal librarians here? Well, we still would like to acknowledge them and their work because without them, I wouldn't be able to share some of what I'm going to share with you today. So um, I give a shout out to all of the tribal librarians out there. So I started thinking, well, what can I share with you all that might help you understand the role that tribal library, libraries and to some extent the archives and museums, uh, what role does that play in the tribal community? And I can do this based on my professional and personal experience that we, you, were, you heard a little bit about in the introduction. And it's basically uh, almost 30 years of experience working in this area. And um, I'm going to respond primarily from a native or indigenous viewpoint because that's where my personal and professional experience comes from. And I also appreciate that such a perspective has been included in this conference because in many cases they're overlooked. They're not even included. So um, I, I wish to thank the organizing committee for that. So I intend to provide uh, you with some background on the history of tribal libraries and, as I said, museums and archives. And I'm, I'm doing this because I'm hoping this will help you uh, in your work. If you can come away with uh, the, pers the perception that tribes, or how tribal folks perceive these libraries, how they perceive cultural institutions, that might help you in your work uh, when you're doing your own outreach programs, your designing programs, collections management, developing collections, establishing partnership, increasing communication. I know that that was part of the remarks the, your board chair just mentioned here today, the goal of this, this work for libraries. I sat in a little bit on a session this afternoon where, where that was being discussed. And the library field isn't the only one doing this. You know, the museum field started looking at this back in maybe 90. There was a, a report issued by what was then called the American Association of Museums. It's now the American Alliance of Museums. Excellence and equity. People were looking at that and trying to get a handle that they're losing their patron base, that the neighborhoods are shifting, where museums are located. And, you know, how can the field respond to diversity, to different, different people? And um, so it, it's interesting that we're still talking about that, and we're still continuing this. But in getting ready for this talk and in reviewing some of the work I did, I realized that we have made some change. We have made some progress, but it takes time because it just takes time. Um, so back to the Smithsonian work, uh, just to give you a little bit of background there. Um, it was under the auspices of the newly formed National Museum of the American Indian, where I was hired to uh, develop and implement museum training programs for tribes that were considering starting a museum or cultural center. And so I traveled across the country and in some parts of Canada and was able to actually get to know people, get a, got an overview of different tribes and their work. Um, so, and that has helped me uh, greatly in my understanding because as I said earlier, all, not all the tribes are the same. Everyone is different. And so then, uh, as it was mentioned in the introduction, after that I came here to the Arizona State Museum. And shortly after, excuse me, shortly after I got here in Tucson, I was approached about being involved in this five-state museum project, or five-state project, we called it. And that's when I realized that was back in 1999 when that happened. And uh, that project, uh, I'm, I was happy to remember it. I'm, I'm thinking of it fondly. If there's, if there's anyone here from the Arizona State Library, that remembers all this work. That was a, a good time. Let me tell you, that was five state libraries that came together. Five state librarians put their heads together. It was Arizona, it was Colorado, it was Utah, New Mexico, Nevada, the Heard Museum in Phoenix, where you're going to go to tonight, and the Arizona State Museum. 
And the goal of that project, which was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, was to increase the services available to tribal libraries, museums, and archives. Subsequent national leadership grants were awarded to the State Library and the State Museum to continue with those goals through needs assessments of the tribal cultural organizations and to provide local, regional, and national conferences for training and networking opportunities. Other partners who joined later were the Oregon State Library and the Oklahoma State Library. This work directly influenced the formation of what is now called the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums, or the acronym ATOM, and their work continues to this day. I would really like to acknowledge the work of Gladys Ann Wells, who was a state librarian at that time, and Jane Colby, who was in library development. I worked closely with them as we put forward this project, and I like to think that that project laid the foundation for increased awareness of tribal libraries that has resulted in more staff in some of these library, uh, state libraries, staff dedicated to working with tribal libraries. That certainly happened here in Arizona. Increased funding eligibility for LSTA grants and IMLS grants, and then even maybe room on the agenda here for something like this. So um, it's great to see all of the tribal libraries in Arizona now included on the website of the state library as a directory. That didn't happen before. And it was, I took it as a, a great opportunity to work with the tribes again in this area, but it was, um, it, there was some resistance to this uh, notion as we started our work. But there was also a lot of deliberate, regular opportunities for communication facilitated communication that resulted in partnerships forming, and it was a lot of time. So as I mentioned earlier, change has happened, and as you look to your areas to work and establish partnerships, it takes time and dedication and a commitment. But the result is, is good because you get different perspectives and you can advance the work in your field with all kinds of people. So it's that experience that I want to draw from today as I share with you a little bit more about the tribal libraries, tribal library development. And um, as I talk about the libraries, I'll maybe shift into museums and archives at the same time because a common tribal cultural perspective, if you ask someone on the reservation community, they're going to tell you that the notion of library, museum, and archive, it's all the same. It's one and the same and there's less of a demarcation in terms of function and purpose than there might be outside the reservation community. This kind of lends itself to more of a holistic way of thinking about some uh, projects, some of, of how tribes view things like that. It's more holistic and not in different categories. So like many other initiatives in Indian country, the development of tribal libraries began with federal legislation. In 1985, Congress enabled the Title IV Library Services for Indian Tribes and Hawaiian Native Programs to be added to the Library Services and Construction Act, which provided a source of funding for tribal libraries. Of course, this legislation followed years of work punctuated by the White House pre-conferences on Indian Library and Information Services on or near reservations held in 1978 and the 1979 White House Conference on Library and Information Services. One individual in particular, Dr. Lotsi Patterson, played a very important role with her advocacy and commitment to tribal libraries. She established in the 70s the American Indian Library Association under the ALA, and she also worked with a number of Pueblo communities in New Mexico to develop tribal libraries in the 70s. Um, and with funding that was provided through the legislation, she developed a training program for tribal libraries that was widely used, and I think maybe some people still look to, it, to that today. Also, during the 70s, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium was founded by six tribal colleges in order to provide a support network as they worked to influence federal policy regarding American Indian education. Today, AHEC is celebrating its 45th year, and they have now 37 tribally controlled colleges and universities. The growth of the tribal college community has also contributed to more tribal libraries since um, they're, for accreditation there are required to have one. Regarding museums, the first wave of tribal museum development also occurred during the 70s as a result of federal block grants designed to stimulate economic development through tourism on Indian reservations. 
Those first museums ended up being virtual shells without any support for staff training or sustainability. The next wave of tribal museum activity occurred during the 90s when the National Museum of the American Indian Act and the National Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act were passed within one year of the other. The 90s were a time for increased cultural awareness by Native Americans. The passage of NAGPRA brought with it a heightened interest in tribal material culture that was being returned to tribes. The type of material being returned were by legislation, sacred and ceremonial, and also included human remains. During that time, tribes also had the opportunity to envision the National Museum of the American Indian as the museum held consultations with tribal communities, several of which included tribal library representation. I just want to step back and say for all the activities occurring in the 70s, it's important to note that the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act was passed in 1975. That act meant that the government could now contract with tribal governments for federal services. The act rejuvenated tribal governments by rejecting and countering previous paternalistic policies. Native American people were now able to operate their own schools. Native Americans took control of their own education by bringing in their own languages, beliefs, and philosophies to their schools. And you can see this particularly in the tribal colleges. Subsequent amendments to the act regarding self-governance recognize that Indian tribes can provide better governmental services to their own members than distant federal bureaucracies. Expanded and refined in subsequent legislation in 1994 and 2000, the self-governance policy has proven so successful that today over 50% of all federal Indian programs are carried out by tribes rather than federal agencies. So you see the result of that today with tribes managing and generating their own revenue, funding their own programs, et cetera. And, and you can see that growth, for example, out at Salt River. So I mentioned only a few pieces of key legislation that have affected Native Americans, and there are many more. What I would like for you to understand is that the relationship between the federal government and tribal nations is based on the sovereignty of tribal nations or a government to government relationship. Treaties then were entered and signed, which of course resulted in a loss of land for tribes. In exchange for land, the federal government agreed to provide education and health services. In order to manage the promised services, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was established. Education was imposed on tribal nations and children were forced to go to boarding schools. Here begins the history of tradition of Native people always having to try to fit into prescribed categories defined by a foreign culture. To this day, many tribal community members equate libraries with schools and view them only as a place for children. Museums and tribal communities were initially resisted due to the colonial nature and predatory role that museums played in the collecting and control of indigenous material culture. A lot of that is changing, though, and it's exciting to see how tribes are making these institutions their own. So of the tribal, I'll start with the tribal colleges. Um, the majority of them are located in rural, isolated communities, and they often serve as a public library for their communities as well, offering Wi-Fi when possible, public computers, GED classes and language and culture classes. So just a note before I forget about the, the Wi-Fi, the broadband, um, that is still an issue for many tribal libraries. They are not up to uh, the standard uh, to, to be able to provide internet service for many of their people. And the last uh, bit of information I saw about that is that there was a bill, some legislation presented in Congress to address that called the Tribal Connect Act. But I don't think that has moved forward. It, I think it was um, presented and then put back into the committee, the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs. But that remains an issue. For tribes out here that are near urban places, it's not a problem. But there are still so many um, uh, call it tribal colleges, especially uh, in the Northern Plains that are, are rural, and, and that is definitely an issue. So I just wanted to show a few slides of some of the um, tribal colleges out there. Uh, so this is the 
uh, Otham Community College, and they are located about an hour west of Tucson. And they just got a new space, and you can see there that it's uh, pretty, um, there, compared to the other one, it was, it was, this is very, pretty big. And I had chatted with the librarian that they have out there, and she was uh, happy to share that they um, are seeking to work not only with students, but with the community. But in this sense, there's, they share this goal with you all, and that they're trying to make the community aware of the services there at the library, and that they can actually take advantage of it. Somebody once said to her, like, uh, I, can I go? I'm not even a student. I'm not, a, I'm not going to school. Can I go to the library? And she said, yes, yes, of course. So, so they share that with you all and trying to get the, the doors open, trying to have people there and use their services. Uh, there are three other libraries on the reservation. I think I have a slide just to point this out about the distances that you can see where the libraries are located. One is in San Avir District, which is quite near Tucson. One is in uh, near Gila Bend, and then the other at the college. And she, probably like many of you all too, is trying to establish a consortium where she can, they can get together and talk and share their work and share ideas and encourage each other in their work uh, to engage the community. Another example of the, I can't really see it here, but there's little stars in that map. And those are, I think there's, nine, maybe 12 other branch libraries of the um, Oglala Lakota College in uh, South Dakota. And they um, ride the circuit. They have people that ride around and go and work in these places. And again, the issue is try to get their tribal members to use the library. I think part of this, um, as I mentioned before, this is something that was imposed on tribal people. The notion of a library literacy you saw on the slides earlier of that that monument that building it was not from traditional tribal cultural practice it's an alien thing and they're still and i think that's still there's still some support that is needed from elected tribal officials in supporting tribal libraries because really for the most part they're very dependent on the imls funding that they have through the library services program they're the basic grant and the enhancement grants I'm pleased that they're eligible and using them, but I think many of them um, do not have the support. I think museums get more support from their tribes than the libraries. But the dedicated librarians are out there working to um, connect with their community. And it's interesting to note too that when AHEC first had this vision of, the, of creating these libraries and places for their people to getting, getting control of their own education, that they included libraries and archives and they wanted to counter the narrative happening at that time, that there was not a lot of native writers or voices that they had access to. They wanted to be able to have n native newspapers from all over in the library so, so community members and students could read about what was happening in other areas of, of the Indian country, other reservations. They want to highlight native authors. Many of them now uh, proudly have their own collections that focus on their area. Uh, this is the Wooden Legs uh, Tribal uh, Community College. It's for Chief Dolknife um, College in um, Montana with the Northern Cheyenne people. And they have a Cheyenne collection. I thought I had that photo in there, but I don't. But they, you know, have these things like this trunk, um, and they call it their buffalo trunk, as you can see. So it's mostly for tribal culture, for teachers to check out, for people to use, and again, try to uh, promote culture uh, within the schools. It's interesting to note that back in the 70s when folks back then had this vision of the tribes wanting to control their own education and include language and culture, that that's still, it's still hard to do um, in that the education system, the imposition of that foreign system, the result of that is it still runs deep. And it's hard to break out of that when that's all you've known. But inside, you know that this isn't our way. And so we have tribal librarians there working to promote this sort of cultural knowledge to, to young people who may not be getting it now. It's sad to see sometimes, but um, they're somehow missing some of this cultural information. Just like many of the youth 
in, in regular society. I mean, you're bombarded with all of this digital information and other information. And, uh, you know, you look to see where you are in this, where, where are the native people in this, where are the perspectives. So I'm glad, though, that they're, they have these uh, kits, they have this emphasis, but it's not, it's going to, again, it's going to have to take some sustainability and some commitment um, to, to continue that. The, uh, I wanted to mention a training program, the Tribal College Librarians Professional Development Training Institute. It's held annually. Uh, it began in the 90s and it came out of Bozeman in Montana. And that started because they recognized the need for the librarians and tribal colleges that didn't go to, don't have an, um, a master's degree in information and library sciences. And, but yet we're still called to do this work. So this training uh, institute is very popular. It's still going on. It started out as just being for like, I think six tribal colleges and it's grown to a lot of people, 60 people all, from all over. You have uh, Australian Aboriginal people, you have uh, New Zealand uh, Maori people coming to this. And so that's another, it's just, it's been out there for a while, about in the 90s is when it started. But that's what they're doing to support uh, tribal librarians in the, in the tribal college community. Quickly, I want to go to some of the tribal libraries in Arizona. Arizona has 25 tribal libraries. A lot of them um, were started by other folks, uh, interested folks, not necessarily tribal uh, people in the community wanting a library, but in this case, um, it was. And, and uh, the knowledge around here is that the CRIT, the Colorado River Indian Tribes Library and Archives, is the oldest library in the state. And they had a council person, a member of the community, who recognized the value of the library for his people regarding education and established this by bringing in consultants, two consultants from the University of Arizona and they spent time on the reservation and helped put this together and it's been around for quite a while so this is just a you know what kind of the programs they have they're the cultural programs they're doing beading workshops there they're making um, crafts there they're having language programs there and their archives um, are full of uh, oral histories and language and uh, just quickly another uh, community library is at Akchin, which i mentioned was a uh, related to the Oatham tribes. And that's just down the road here a little bit, uh, Akshin. And I don't know if you can see, the, can see the name of the building there, but it's in their language. And it's Ohon Nyokulid Kuch Mashkama Vemta Daki. And that is basically Ohon Nyokulid Mashkama Vemta Daki is a place where they can uh, speak and read and that's the house that's it is it's just it's a very uh, I probably sure I butchered the interpretation but um, I like to try to use the languages when I greeted you at the Kiowa language of course that's not my first language my parents were two different tribes we grew up speaking English but I love to try and I love to speak it when I have the opportunity so and I love that they're doing this it's also, in case you didn't know, it's the International Year of Indigenous Languages declared by UNESCO. So I just thought I'd share that to you as well. It's a whole 2019. So I'm trying to remember that and use the language whenever I can. This um, community library is really, you, should, you can see how, how it is. It's the auction community has got a lot of revenue. They have a lot of tribal support. It's a small community. This also uh, serves the neighboring town of Maricopa. Uh, before they had a library, they went to Akchin and were able to use some of their material. They have a language program where they hand out um, languages loaded onto iPads and they're checked out and the students can use those, the young people. Again, the emphasis here though seems to be on the, the uh, ch uh, children. Excuse me, this is the um, museum and that predated the uh, library for, uh, for about maybe 10 years, 10 or 15 years. And um, Akchin also has an archive. And the archive used to be located in uh, the museum. And one thing I just want to say about Akchin is that this is an example where the tribes, uh, when they're building these institutions, even though on the surface it looks like just another building, just another program, there's so much thought 
taken into this regarding how Akhchin people are, how Akhchin people work. It's a, it's a cultural perspective, a tribal perspective. They, they went door to door in their community and communicated about what they wanted to do with their museum. They um, talked to their elders, they're guided by them, and they make things accessible and it's for them. It's not necessarily a museum on the busy highway where people can come and just get tourists, but it's for them and for their people. And they have quite a reputation for the way that they continue, for the, how they conduct themselves in that manner. It harkens back to some of the traditional um, Akchin, Atam ways of doing things. And it, there's a very subtle differences and diff subtle behaviors that you can see in a lot of museum and cultural center development, a lot of library development. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that, that that's happening too, even though um, it's a foreign concept. Native people are trying to make it their own. They always have actually tried to adapt and make things their own, except that now it's just, in, it, there's more energy behind it. Um, you hear the word now, uh, indigenization, um, uh, trying to combat colonialism. N young Native scholars in the academy are addressing this. And um, so, but it's actually something that has always been going on, always adapting, because we had to fit into these prescribed notions and we had to make it work for ourselves. Uh, this is a, a photo from Salt River, the tribal library that I mentioned right out here. They were partnering with, uh, I think it was Arizona State University, to do a workshop on archives. And I think that, I'm, I love to see these partnerships happen too. And I like to think that uh, the Five State Project maybe had something to do with that by letting people know there's, there's ways to partner, there's people out there, there's things they need, there's things they can learn from each other. And that's uh, very exciting. So quickly now, one last thing about, quickly about archives. I just wanted to share with you that, um, as I mentioned, the tribal colleges included archives in their work. And that's a place, of course, to, st uh, to have the cultural records, the archives. A lot of these are secondary sources. They're not necessarily primary ones. But it's the idea of having, let's have all of the information related to our people in one place. So we don't have to go out and find that. And there was a big project, uh, must have been the 90s, especially when Tribe in Oregon, where they copied almost everything from the Smithsonian's um, National Anthropological Archives, took it home, took it, shared it with other tribes, and had a big celebration of having this material in their home communities. I want to share this uh, next slide here is the Tomustalik Cultural Institute in Oregon. And I want to end on this note. It's just a little story I want to share with you about what's happening in this picture. And that is um, the, man, uh, the man is listening to a recording. And the recording was uh, donated to their archives. It's from an ethnomusicologist and it's recordings from a, songs related to a ceremony that pertains to veterans, you could say, war-related um, exploits. And this ethnomusicologist, aware of the archives, donated his material there. So it's primary material there. And this person, just tribal person, came. He, they have a charter high school. He heard about these songs. He wanted to listen to them and reintroduce this song accompanied by a dance to the high school. And so this has just happened like two or three weeks ago when schools opened up for them. And they were able to recreate this with the music and they did it at their tribal archives. And what pleases me about this is that there's no middleman, so to speak. That this person could go, he didn't have to travel far, he knew the staff there. They knew each other. They, they, there, was, there was none of this explaining that you always have to do. Native people have always had to explain to get the situation and then make it fit for themselves, for ourselves. And in this case, it was easy. And it's a good example of how tribes are, are taking charge and managing and interpreting their own culture in ways that work for them. I think I've gone over my time a little bit, but I thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.